Once again, Christian greetings to all our valued listeners and viewers throughout the whole world. More particularly to all Shepherds Rod believers and most especially to our beloved brothers and sisters in the United States of America. A special greetings to our brethren in Colorado, to our brethren in Georgia, in Fiji Island, Mexico, Spain, in Africa, to the United Kingdom, and also to our brethren in Australia, and to the rest of the 144,000 living saints scattered abroad. Greetings. May the good Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. This is our episode number five on the subject. The Assyrian Confederacy. And since such subject includes the three chapters of the book of Nahum, according to 1 TG number 24, page 11, saying, This afternoon, we are to study the book of Nahum. The burden of this entire book, three chapters in all, is concerning two separate people. So that is very plain. So, if we'll be studying the subject concerning the Assyrian Confederacy includes the entire book of Nahum, which three chapters in all. And accordingly, it says, the entire three chapters of the book of Nahum is concerning two separate people. So, it is concerning two separate people. Now, the very first verse that had been quoted is, Nahum chapter 1 verse 1 and chapter 3 verse 18. It says, The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkosite, thy shepherds is lumber. O king of Assyria, thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. Then it says, Plainly, Assyria with her capital city, Nineveh, are the one people. Now, who are they? The nobles mentioned here by which they dwell in the dust. And who are they? The people mentioned here which is scattered upon the mountains and no man gathereth them. I will no longer read statements to prove that mountains in the Bible as interpreted by the shepherd's rod represent churches or denominations and the illustration saying thy nobles shall dwell in the dust figuratively speaking they were in a very low standard now let us connect track number 14 so let's read the statement page 5 it says two powers are seen rising in their might against each other. Indeed, the all-consuming concern of Nahum's entire book, so that is concerning Nahum entire book, the same in 1 TG 24-11. But three short chapters in all, so three short chapters in all, centers in the preparation for this conflict, the conflict itself, and the titles of the powers in bold. Now, we already explained that there must be four nations to typify Judah, Israel, Syria, and Assyria, according to Track 14, page 33. So, I would like to read Track 14, page 33. But the simple historical fact that these two kingdoms were overthrown centuries before Emmanuel was even born, brings a time discrepancy which can be reconciled only by the conclusion that all four nations, Judah, Israel, Syria, and Assyria, involved in this historical action were typical of four others that were to arise sometime following Emmanuel's birth for after his birth, Israel and Syria were to be conquered by Assyria. And we are now dealing the perfect fulfillment of this prophetic event. Therefore, we need to concretely establish who are they 
represented by Syria, represented by Israel, represented by Judah, and represented by Assyria. But we already explained in such historical events that Israel were also divided in the time of Rehoboam. The ten tribes occupied the northern portion of Palestine and their temple was established in Mount Gerizim under the leadership of Jeroboam. But many of them, represented by the ten tribes, returned their allegiance to Rehoboam because of the faithfulness of Rehoboam. So we have the ten tribes that remain in the northern portion and we have the ten tribes that returned to Jerusalem. And they were the people by which, accordingly, in the time of Hezekiah, they participated with such reformation. So, let us read Prophets and Kings. It says, 335, The good beginning made at the time of the purification of the temple was followed by a broader movement in which Israel, as well as Judah, participated. So the ten tribes mentioned there, or the ten tribes mentioned in this reading, they are those who returned to Jerusalem in the first three years of the reign of King Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. So let us read page 93. It says, but the secret of Judah's prosperity during the first years of Rehoboam's reign lay not in these measures. It was the recognition of God as the supreme ruler that placed the tribes of Judah and Benjamin on vantage ground. To their number were added many God-fearing men from the northern tribes out of all the tribes of Israel. And we know the word all included the ten tribes, all of them. The representation is complete. The records reads, Such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong. Three years, for three years, they walked in the way of David. And Solomon, verse 16 and 17. But the two tribes as well, in the days of King Ahaz, was divided. Majority of them followed King Ahaz and then submitted themselves to the king of Assyria, Tiglat Pileser. Now let us read Prophets and Kings 329. Well would it have been for the kingdom of Judah had Ahaz received this message as from heaven. But choosing to lean on the arm of flesh, he sought to help from the heathen. In desperation, he sent word to Tiglat Pileser, king of Assyria, I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. Second Kings 16 verse 7. The request was accompanied by a rich present from the king's treasure and from the temple storehouse. So, we need to distinctly separate the ten tribes that remain in the northern kingdom. Who are they? The antitype. The ten tribes that return their allegiance to and join to the two tribes. Who are they? The antitype. And the two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, who are they that followed King Ahaz, and who are they that remain their faithfulness and allegiance to God? And they called us the house of David. So those things is very important. Now let us focus our attention on Assyria, saying in 1 TG 24, page 11, that Assyria and Nineveh are the one people. Now let us read again uh, track number 14. That is under uh, time and chance, soul mysteries. So here, let us read in track number 14. I think it is 51. Time and chance solve mysteries. Time and chance are still the most trustworthy witnesses. 
as well as the best disclosers of mysteries. They now give the answers to the questions. Which one of the nations is the Assyria of today? So that is the question. Which one of the nations is the Assyria of today? Who is he that does it in pieces? When does the class of these two mortal enemies take place? And as I've said, there's really a remarkable number of years from the time this reading material was written in 1943, this year 2020, there are already 77 years. Two complete number. Two number seven. Now, let us now um, study closely. Who is the Assyria of today? Year 2020. Now, let us read again. One TG. 23, page 5 and page 6. It says, From this we see, that the Assyria under discussion exists in the time of the end. So it says here that the Assyria under discussion exists in the time of the end. But what the time of the end mentioned here? The time in which the great and dreadful day of the Lord takes place. I will no longer read the entire enumeration, but all these things... The seven enumeration points out unmistakably to the United States of America. The English speaking people. 1TG 23 page 5 and 6. Only United States of America by which the entire 50 states, all of them are English speaking people. Now what is the great and dreadful day of the Lord? Now let us read. Track number 4 on page 60 and page 61. So let us read the same verse. In an effort to save our brethren from the imminent vengeance of God, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Malachi 4 verse 5. What is the great and dreadful day of the Lord? The imminent vengeance of our God. Therefore, that is pointing to the day of vengeance by which closely connected to Isaiah 61 because that is the verse by which the day of vengeance is mentioned and also Isaiah 63 verse 4 now I would like to read first 1 SR 100 let's read 1 SR page 154 the day of vengeance in Isaiah 61 verse 2 follows the year the year of what? The year of my redeem. The same in Isaiah 63 verse 4. So the day of vengeance in Isaiah 61 verse 2 follows the year. The day may be prophetic, which in that case would mean a literal year. Thus, it would mean a year in its case. This year of vengeance is not the seven last plagues, nor is it the destruction of the wicked at the second coming of Christ. It takes place before the close of provision. For in the fourth verse we read, And they shall build the old wazes, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. The meaning of this verse is to restore the truth of God, which has been trodden down underfoot for many generations. The 144,000, the true Israel of God, are the builders. Thus we see that after the day of vengeance, God's truth is to be restored and revealed to the people. Therefore, it must be before the close of provision. So the day of vengeance follows the year of my redeem. We have the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the year of my redeem. And immediately after the year of my redeem follows the day of vengeance. Now, let us read 1SR 153. The first verse and part of the second apply to Christ himself. At the beginning of his ministry. So, that is very plain. It says, The first verse and part of the second apply to Christ himself at the beginning of his ministry. The spirit of prophecy says it will repeat itself with the people of God. This would find its fulfillment in the time of harvest with the 144,000, those who escaped the ruin of Isaiah 59 and 63 
by whose effort the great multitude of Revelation 7 verse 9 is made. 1 SR page 153. Now, let us study closely, brethren, uh, this prophecy. Why is it that I need to connect Isaiah 61 verse 1 and 2 and Isaiah 63 verse 4 because of the day of vengeance, which is the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Because according to our reading in 1 TG 23, 5 and 6, it must be concerning the Assyria in the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So to establish firmly the great and dreadful day of the Lord is to concretely establish also the subject concerning Assyria. So it is very important to establish that prophetic event, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. By which P.T. Hotep himself says that such event was still future in his days. Let us read Answerer number 3, page 88. And looking forward to the time of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the time just ahead of us, the Lord admonishes the people who will be living at that time. Remember ye yeah, the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Malachi 4, verse 4. Answerer number 3, page 88. The prophet declared clearly that such period of time, the great and dreadful day of the Lord is still ahead in their days. And the statement to the people who will be living at that time, for sure, they are the people by which God designs them to be translated to heaven no longer to taste death you and i if we will be faithful now i would like to read track number nine page 29 track number nine page 29 it says god is jealous declares the prophet nahum in his vision of the time of the end then quoted nahum chapter one brothers and sisters and I think it is up to, um, but let us um, focus first to the, the first quotation from chapter 1 up to um, the statement here on verse 6 and verse 7 and to verse 9. So, Bithi Hotep quoted Nahum chapter 1 from verse 2 to verse 9. Now, let us now read. First of all, Bethi Hotep made it so plain that verse 2 to verse 9, it is the prophecy that will be fulfilled in the time of the end. But more specifically, in 1 TG 23, page 5 and 6, in the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Because the time of the end is divided into two divisions. The period of the time in the judgment that pertains to the dead. And the time of the end in the period of time in the judgment that pertains to the living. And that is the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Mentioned in 1 TG 23 on pages uh, 5 and 6. So let us read verse 2 in Nahum chapter 1. God is jealous and the Lord revenge it. The Lord revenge it and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. And he reserved wrath for his enemies. Now to repeat again, who are they? The adversaries of the Lord. Because the shepherds had made it so plain that the Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. Now let us read track number six. So let the shepherd's rod speaks of itself. Track number six, page 26. Brother, sister, upon each of us is squarely false the momentous responsibility of deciding whether we will choose to follow the prophets of God in both the Old and New Testament periods or to join God's adversaries who advocate uninspired interpretation of the scriptures and who along with all their sympathizers will if they continue in their evil course, become guilty with the juice of the shed blood of the prophets. Who are they, the adversaries of the Lord? Those who advocate uninspired interpretation of the scriptures 
of course, the statement who advocate, they are the one who um, established or provided such uninspired doctrines, uninspired interpretation of the scriptures, and also together with all their sympathizers, sympathizers, brothers and sisters, and to all the honest and faithful Bible students, brethren, it is high time now to be very watchful on our steps. Here in 2 TG 46, page 43 and page 44, it says here, the only ones that will endure to the end will be those who carefully watch their steps from being carried away either by his additions to or by his subtractions from the works of inspiration. Now, brothers and sisters, one of the prominent acts by, by which our names will be blotted out in the Lamb's Book of Life is by engaging private interpretation. The only inspired comments is the golden bowl. Now, I would like to read this reading in track number 6. It says here, Clearly then, track number 6, page 23, Clearly then, the bowl in which the golden oil is stored symbolizes the storehouse of present truth. The word interpreted, the only storehouse that contains inspired comments on both testaments is the books of the spirit of prophecy. They therefore are the golden bowl. The symbolism definitely points out that from them, the ministers must get the light producing truth with which to supply the church so that it may brightly shine in this dark world drawing to the light all men who hate the darkness. Are we among the people who hate the darkness? Then you will never accept any doctrine or precept by which such explanation, such ideas cannot be found in the writings represented by the two pipes, Ellen G. White and B.T. Hodder. Brothers and sisters, the golden bowl, it says the two pipes through which the oil is carried into the bowl can represent only the channels, prophets, through whom the oil is transferred from the Bible into the bowl in the period during which both olive trees, Old and New Testaments, live the Christian era. Well, we need always to stand that principle that in matters of conscience, let us left every individual soul untrammed. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind, according to the desire of ages. Quoting Romans 14, verse 5. And also, B.T. Hotter quoted that verse in the old symbolic code. One symbolic code, number 4, page 1. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind is our position. Romans 14, verse 5. For example, I am fully persuaded, me, with myself, that the two pipes represent only Sister White and B.T. Hotter. And the golden bowl is pointing to the writings of Sister White and B.T. Hodder. But since both of them, Sister White and B.T. Hodder, recommends the writings of Alonso Jones and Wagoner, as well as the writings of William Miller, both of them, Sister White and B.T. Hodder, therefore, we need also those writings because it was recommended by the two prophets. And it seems the number of the Bible stands here because William Miller, Sister White, Alonso Jones, Wagoner and P.T. Hotep. Number five is the number of the Bible. But there are some Davidian uh, who believe that there are still another writings besides the writings of P.T. Hotep. Well, that is their own prerogative. And we, it is not our duty to ruin their reputation. Brothers and sisters, I can only express my belief. I will establish firmly and concretely that the two pipes represent only Sister White and B.T. Hotter. And if you are not persuaded with such explanation and according to you, there are still writings besides the writings of B.T. Hotter that you considered as being inspired, then that is your own uh, absolute freedom. I would like to read here in track number 13. 
I love so much this reading. It says here, track number 13, page 28 and 29. Remember that everyone has the right to believe as he will, and that he must give an account of himself to the Lord only, not to you. Grant to all the freedom of religion that you would have them grant to you. And though a Christian will never sacrifice principle, yet he will ever be as courteous to those who disagree with him as to those who agree. All things whatsoever you would do that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Do you even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Matthew 7 verse 12. Yea, thus is the teaching of both. And so to receive all these holy gifts, you must forsake egotism, self-confidence, pride of opinion, prejudices. Track number 13, page 28 and page 29. Now, let us go back to our subject, brothers and sisters. We focus first our attention to ascertain clearly who are they, the adversaries of the Lord. Recorded in Nahum chapter 1 verse 2 because they are the very ones by which the Lord will take vengeance against those adversaries of the Lord. And according to track number 6, page 26, the adversaries of the Lord, they are those who advocate an inspired interpretation of the scriptures and also those who sympathize with them. And since we already read in track number 6, page 23 and 24, the only inspired comments, the authoritative interpretation is the golden bowl produced by the two pipes which none other than Sister White and Betty Hothet. And that's what it means in 2SR page 289. I would like to read to you. It says, find your explanations in the bowl. Or in other words, the only explanations that we need to accept are those explanations that can be found in the golden bowl. And you will have no trouble in knowing the truth or of avoiding the ever-ready trap of deception. Thus the difficulty in knowing the difference between truth and error is eliminated. So there will be no more difficulty in knowing the difference between truth and error. It is immediately eliminated if you hate darkness. What is darkness? Messages, ideas that cannot be found written in the golden bowl. For example, those who teach as they posted it on internet that Lebanon is the Millerites or William Miller and Sharon in Isaiah 33 verse 9 is the Seventh-day Adventist and Bashan is Bingham. Such allegations, such statements cannot be found in the golden bowl. Brothers and sisters, that is why B.T. Hotev says, I would like to read track number 11. However, however plausible, or it seems reasonable. Track number 11, page 12. All present truth believers should now see the necessity of shunning every wind of doctrine regardless how plausible or reasonable it might appear to be. If you will look at their reasons, it seems reasonable and it seems plausible. But Betty Hodem says, regardless, the admonition says, get your doctrine, brother, sister, only from the golden bowl. And be not like the waves of the sea, driven with the wind and thus be not carried about by the many winds of doctrine that are blowing wildly from every direction to cause you to lose your way to the everlasting kingdom. Get your doctrine, brother, sister, only from the golden bowl. Only. There is no other. We are truth lovers. But the word of truth is the word it is written. And if that ideas, if that doctrine cannot be found in the written records of the spirit prophecy and the shepherd's rod publications, it cannot be the truth. It says in volume 6, page 19, the word of truth it is written is the gospel we are to preach. Volume 6, page 
19. Unless these brethren can produce a statement that Isaiah 33 verse 9, that Lebanon there represent the Millerites movement according to them, and then Sharon represent the Seventh-day Adventist church, and Bashan represent Bingham, unless such ideas can be concretely established, whether in the writings of Sister White and B.T. Hotep, it cannot be the truth. It is uninspired interpretations. And they are the adversaries of the Lord. Those who advocated uninspired interpretation of the scriptures. Ponder deeply, brethren. Remember, in track number 6, I would like to read to you. Track number 6, on page 76, For if one's interpretation of the scriptures is not supported by every sentence of holy writ, it is a palacious interpretation, a blind conclusion without Bible foundation. You see what the shepherd's rod teaches? Every explanation, every sentence, be it sure that such statement is written in the Holy Writ or inspired records. How much more if it is already one paragraph by which the entire paragraph, brothers and sisters, never been supported by the word it is written. They quoted the five angels' messages in Revelation 14 to attach Isaiah 33 verse 9. Can anyone produce the statement in the writings of Sister White and B.T. Hotep that Revelation 14 is the explanation of Isaiah 33 verse 9? We are following the footsteps of the Jewish people. The scriptures have been misapplied. Isaiah 33 verse 9 and Revelation 14 is a different prophecy. Has no connection at all, my dear brothers and sisters. And the only connection is that by our uninspired explanation. By which such explanation cannot be found in the golden, in the golden bowl. And who are they? The enemies. Because Nahum chapter 1 verse 2, the, the vengeance of our God, he will take revenge to his adversaries and to his enemies. So I, I would not use my own words. When the statement adversaries, so I need to read in the shepherd's rod the word adversaries. Track number 6, page 26. Who are they, the adversaries of the Lord? Those who advocated uninspired interpretation of the scriptures. And how we could ascertain clearly that such interpretation are uninspired if such explanation cannot be found in the golden bowl. Because the only inspired comments, according to track number 6, page 23, the only inspired comments is found in the golden bowl. How about the enemies? Who are they, the enemies of the Lord? So let us read in track number 8. Although such enemies of the Lord is found in the Bible itself. Now, I would like to read first the Bible. Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, it says, on verse 27, But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Luke 19 verse 27. Who are they the enemies of the Lord? They are those who refuse to submit themselves to the one appointed by God to reign in his stead. Well, that statement can also be applied in the days of B.T. Hotham. That the enemies of the Lord, those who refuse to submit to the inspiration of B.T. Hotham. But for sure, brethren, it could no longer be applied in our days because God never used a dead prophet to reign in his stead. So I would like to read again the old symbolic code, the statement given by the shepherd's rod. It says here, old symbolic code, five symbolic code, 6 to 12, page 15. Five symbolic code, 6 to 12, page 15. It says, no one denies the fact that a number of times in the scriptures Christ is called a man. But you surely will not try to make me believe that the man in Luke 19.14 is Christ himself. I care not how spiritually blind you may be. You can still see the literal part of the scripture. That at the time those citizens sent the message Christ was in heaven. And the man whom they did not want to reign over them was on earth. 
and that this happened before Christ returned. In 4 Symbolic Code 10 to 12, page 7, 4 Symbolic Code 10 to 12, page 7, it says, Others, though not so dictatorial, will not submit themselves to the leadership of God. For Jesus pursued the class that hated him and sent message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. Luke 19, verse 14. Therefore, because of their insubordination, Jesus has plainly told that at his appearing, he shall command his servants, saying, But those mine enemies, so that is the enemies of the Lord, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Luke 19 verse 27. The parable makes it clear that through some men, Jesus is to reign before, Jesus is to reign before his appearing, and that those who refuse to submit themselves to the one whom Jesus has chosen to represent him shall lose out eternally. I think that statement is very plain. Lose out eternally. Now, I would like to read um, track number 8. So, let us read track number 8 pages. I think page 70. So, track number 8, page 70. So, let us read this statement. It says, Observe that in the message which they sent after him, his servants did not say, We will not have you to reign over us. But rather, we will not have this man to reign over us. What they objected to was Christ reigning over them through someone else. So what they objected to was Christ reigning over them through someone else. Clearly then, before his, he is coronated and prior to his return, to reckon with his servants, he appoints a man to reign over them in his stead. Whereupon they say to him, by their attitude, and stand toward his message. We will not have this man to reign over us. Although this man, as we now see, is the antitypical David, the simple means the visible king. Track number 8, page 70. Now the statement can be easily understood that this antitypical David, the simple means chosen by God to represent him chosen by God to reign in his stead. That is prior to the time when God commanded his servants to slay his enemies before him. Why is it that these people are called by God as his enemies? Because they refuse to submit themselves to the one chosen by God. So whoever that man chosen by God those who refused to submit themselves to that man, God regarded them as his enemies. And Jesus will come. And then, that is the time by which that predicted event to slay his enemies will be executed. Now, I would like to read track number 6, pages 55 and page 56. Track number 6, page 55 and page 56. The scriptures make clear that while in the sanctuary, so while Jesus Christ was still in the heavenly sanctuary, Christ receives the kingdom. After the thrones are cast down and after the investigative judgment is completed before his second coming, that this is so is further evidenced by the parable of Luke 19 verse 15 which states, that Christ receives the kingdom and that afterwards he comes to slay his enemies. The coming mentioned here, second coming, is the second invisible coming of Jesus Christ. Although that is not our subject because our subject is concerning now. Just to elaborate, who are they? The adversaries of the Lord and the enemies of God. Who are they, the adversaries of the Lord? Track number 626. Those who advocated uninspired interpretation of the scriptures. Who are they? Those people teaching doctrines that cannot be found in the golden bowl. And one of the examples that I could give is that Isaiah 33 verse 9. And those people are not afraid to engage in private interpretation. They proudly proclaim 
that Lebanon is the Millerites, Sharon is the Seventh day Adventist Church, and Bashan is Bingham, by which such doctrine cannot be found in the Golden Bowl. How could it be that Lebanon is the Millerites? When Bithyhotep himself says that Isaiah 34 verse 12, Isaiah 39, 33 verse 9, is still future according to 1 TJ 34 page 12. Now let us read. So they were teaching contradictory to the shepherd's run. If Lebanon here is Millerites, then Bithyhotep must know it. Because it was already in the past. If Sharon here is the seventh day Adventist church, then Bithyhotep will declare it. But look at the explanation given by the shepherd's run. I would like to read to you. 1 TJ 34 page 12. Isaiah 33 verse 9. The earth mourneth and languisheth. Lebanon is ashamed and hewn down. Sharon is like a wilderness. And Bashan and Carmel shake up their fruits. Now let us read the commentary given by the prophet. 1 TJ 34 12. The nouns in this verse being profoundly figurative and the time of fulfillment yet future. So whoever this Lebanon, whoever this Sharon, Bashan, and Carmel, the fulfillment is still future in the days of Bithy Hotep. It was written on 1947. How many nouns mentioned here? Let us enumerate one by one. Earth, because it says the nouns meaning plural form. Earth, second, Lebanon. Third, Sharon. Fourth, Bashan. Pip Carmel. Since the shepherd's rod declared clearly that the nouns in this verse being profoundly figurative, therefore the earth mentioned here cannot be literal earth because it says figurative. Now what is the figurative earth? There is none other except the two horned beast domain. The same with the earth mentioned in Revelation 13. That is very plain in Great Controversy 440. Concerning symbolical earth, that is pointing unmistakably to the United States of America. Now how about, brothers and sisters, Lebanon? Such doctrine promulgated by Bashan that Lebanon is the Millerites, they will have a hard time to produce such statement. And the absolute fact is that they can never produce such statement, except their own statement. Not in the writings of Sister White, neither in the Shepherd's Rod publications. And those who hate the darkness, according to track number 6, page 23, will never accept such doctrine. Now, I would like to read to you Prophets and Kings. So, let us read Prophets and Kings 363. So, let me read to you Prophets and Kings 363. Let us read. The Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of an high stature and his top was among the thick bows. Under his shadow dwelt all great nations. Thus was he fair in his greatness in the land of his branches for his root was by great waters the cedars in the garden of God could not hide him, for fir trees were not like his bows, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. All the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God invite him. Ezekiel 31 verse 3 to 9. Now look at both prophets. Connect Ezekiel 31 to the subject in the book of Nahum. Now let me read to you Bithy Hotep. Track number 14, pages 8 and 9. So let us read. Nahum. So let us read. Nahum chapter 2, verse 3. Track 14, page 8 and 9. The shield of his mighty men is made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. And the fear trees shall be terribly shaken. Very evident, it is that this aggressor power who does it in pieces girds himself for war. 
in the day when the chariots have such blazing lights, powerful electric headlights that they resemble flaming torches. In the day of this phenomenon, the fiertest, the great rulers of earth, Ezekiel 31, verse 1 to 14, shall be terribly shaken. You see, brothers and sisters, here the shepherd's rod connect Ezekiel 31, verse 1 to 14. If you will read Ezekiel 31, verse 1 to 14, there are two nations mentioned there, Egypt and Assyria. Verse 1 and 2, pointing to Egypt. Verse 3 to 14, pointing to Assyria. Now ponder deeply, brethren. Here in Prophets and Kings, the cedars in Lebanon represent Assyria. Where is that statement saying? Represent the Millerites movement. Brothers and sisters, now let us continue reading in Prophets and Kings 363. It says, But the rulers of Assyria, instead of using their unusual blessings for the benefit of mankind, became the scourge of many lands. So it points out to the United States of America because we read several times for SP 398 saying that of all the lands in the earth, United States of America. Let us read again. For SP 398. The greatest and most favored nation upon the earth is the United States. A gracious providence he has sheltered this country and poured upon her the choices of heaven's blessings. Here the persecuted and oppressed have found refuge. Here the Christian find, here the Christian faith in its purity has been thought. These people have been the recipients of great light and unrivaled mercies, but these gifts had been repaid by ingratitude and forgetfulness of God. The infinite one keeps a reckoning with the nations and their guilt is proportioned to the light rejected. A perfect record now stands in the register of heaven against our land. But the crime which shall fill up the measure of her iniquity is that, make, is that of making void the law of God. You see, brothers and sisters, that is United States of America represented by Assyria. And let us continue reading here in Prophets and Kings, page 363. But the rulers of Assyria, instead of using their unusual blessings for the benefit of mankind, became the scourge of many lands, merciless, with no thought of God or their fellow men. They pursued the fixed policy of causing all nations to acknowledge the supremacy of the gods of Nineveh when they, exalt, they exalted above the Mosai. God has sent Jonah to them with a message of warning. And for a season, they humbled themselves before the Lord of hosts and sought forgiveness. But soon they turned again to idol worship and to the conquest of the world. The prophet Nahum, in his arraignment of the evildoers in Nineveh, exclaimed, Woe to the bloody city. It is full of lies and robbery. The prey departed not. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots, the horsemen lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Nahum chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. And then quoted Nahum chapter 2, or Nahum chapter 3, verse 2, verse 6. You see, Nahum chapter 1, verse 3 to verse 6 had been quoted here in 364, and it is pointing to the United States of America, brothers and sisters. And it says, I would like to read in 364, It was thus that Nineveh, the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am and there is none beside me, become a desolation, empty and void and waste. The dwelling of the lions, and the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion, even the old lion, walk, and the lions will, and none made them afraid. Sipaniah 2 verse 15, Nahum 2 verse 10 and verse 11. Now let us connect the statement in the shepherd's rod. So let us read uh, page 45. 
on page 46 in track number 14. So, track number 14, pages 45 and page 46. It says, The power which destroys the wicked and delivers the righteous. Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. And I remember one of the Davidian brethren when I quoted Nahum 1, verse 4. Then he immediately responded and says, That verse never been uh, commented by B.T. Hodder. And it only shows ignorance in the Shepherd's Rod publications. Now, I would like to read here, track 14, page 45. The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite, God is jealous, and the Lord revenged. The Lord revenged and is furious, for his enemies have destroyed his vineyard. Who are they, the enemies of the Lord? Those who advocate uninspired interpretation of the scriptures. And that is the reason why the Bidyan have been scattered, divided into different groups. Because of that private interpretation. Now, what is the vineyard? Of course, it must be modern vineyard, not ancient vineyard. So let us stick what the shepherds would teach us. So if we want to understand vineyard here, it must be interpreted by the shepherds rod itself. Now, in track number 12, page 43, it says here, track number 12, page 43, to begin with, we see from this scripture that the woman left her vineyard, homeland, Palestine. What is vineyard? Palestine. But since we are talking about, brothers and sisters, modern Assyria, then we need to study also modern vineyard, not ancient vineyard. It's very illogical. The shepherd's rod made it so plain. Vineyard is Palestine. Now let us read 1SR 158. The land of Canaan, 1SR 158. The land of Canaan represents the land into which the church at this present time came into existence, namely the United States of America. The name Palestina means land of strangers. The United States is composed of strangers, people from many nations and races, dukes of Edom, refers to the same class as those mentioned in Isaiah 63 verse 1, as previously explained. The name Moab means progeny or forefathers. No, the shepherd's rod is very plain. And that is why, it's easy to understand the type and anti-type. Now, I would like to, for example, this is Palestine. Palestine. Ancient Palestine. Ancient. As stated in track number 12, page 43. Of course, the woman mentioned the, is the apostolic church. And then pointing to the time by which the woman left the vineyard and went into the wilderness. But what wilderness? Literal wilderness outside the vineyard because this is the vineyard but that is the type of course the anti-type must be symbolical palestine represent united states of america which is the vineyard for example the two movements millerites and seventh day adventist church the shepherds says that that third call and fourth call brothers and sisters they are movements that God raised up in the vineyard. Therefore, vineyard is United States of America because many rights and Seventh-day Adventists is in the United States of America. So there must be two women, brothers and sisters, the woman in the vineyard, that is the Seventh-day Adventist church, and the woman in the wilderness, and that is the Eleventh-hour church. But what wilderness? Figurative. What vineyard? Figurative. Because United States of America is a literal wilderness, but we are talking about type and anti-type. I think it is not difficult to understand, brothers and sisters. Now let us go back again to our reading in track number 14, page 45 and page 46. It says, God is jealous and the Lord revenge it. The Lord revenge it and is furious. Why? For his enemies have destroyed his vineyard. We know that that is figurative speech. How they destroyed God's vineyard? By advocating 
uninspired interpretation of the scriptures. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserved it wrath for his enemies. And then it says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. And the Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, whereas the aircraft of the nations do not. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuked the sea and make it, it dry and dried up all the rivers. But men and their ships go down therein to rise no more. How could such ship be able to sail if there is no more water? Therefore, it is unmovable. When it pertains to ship, we know ship represent movements. All the movements in the United States of America, in reality, are unmovable because there is no water. Whether it boats or ship, it cannot travel without water. So it stays unmovable. And it says, Bayesian languishing and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languishing. Therefore, this whatever this Bayesian and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon, all of them are found in the vineyard. I would like to read to you uh, some passages, brothers and sisters, in the writings of Sister White, Patriarchs and Prophets, and Mount of Blessing. Let me read to you. Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing on page 56. A Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 56. Is Asian. Across the Sea, Mount of Blessing, page 56. The whole paragraph. Across the sea, from the place where they were assembled, was the country of Bashan. So, Bashan here is very plain. It is a country. So, let us read. Mount of Blessings, page 56. Across the sea, from the place where they were assembled, was the country of Bashan, a lonely region whose wild gorges and wooded hills had long been a favorite lurking ground for criminals of all descriptions. Now, I would like to read. What is Bashan? That is the place by, by which favorite lurking ground for criminals of all descriptions. Reports of robbery and murder committed there were pressed in the minds of the people and many were jealous in denouncing these evildoers. Although, Jesus Christ reprimanded them. But what I'm trying to explain let us go back to the historical event. Bashan is a country. And anciently, this country is a favorite lurking ground for criminals of all descriptions. According to the Spirit of Prophecy, that is not my own words. Lurking ground, favorite lurking ground for all criminals in all descriptions. Now, let me read to you. Patriarchs and Prophets. So let us read. Patriarchs and Prophets on page from 433, it says, The Conquest of Bashan. And it is really closely connected in the statement in 1SR. 1SR 243, it says, And it was grossly misinterpreted by many Davidian brethren. So let us read um, the statement. Again note, the men of wisdom shall see thy name. The wisdom mentioned is not that which the world can give but a heavenly one. Do I version read as follows? And salvation, meaning wisdom, shall be to them that fear. See thy name. Hear, O ye tribes. The same thought is brought over in the seventh chapter, verse 14. Feed thy people with thy rod, the pluck of thine heritage, which dwell solitary in the wood, in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. Feed thy people with thy rod. The bird feed is to be understood as spiritual food. And that food, meaning truth, is found in the rod. Therefore, we again have the command to give out the book. Feed thy God's people. Carmel, Bashan, and Gilead are used as symbols of good spiritual pasture. These places are where Israel had their victories. So the same with the statement here in Patriarchs and Prophets 433, Conquest of Bashan, the Conquest of Bashan. So the three places mentioned in Micah 7 verse 14 is the places by which Israel 
had their big stories, meaning the Israelites were not living in these three places, not until that they conquered Bashan, they conquered Carmel, Bashan, and Gilead. Now, let, let us enumerate one by one. It says, Mount Carmel is where Elijah had his experience with the backsliding Israel in the days of Ahab. Because the word victory is, brothers and sisters, that it means conquer. And that is the statement here in Patriots and Prophets 433, the conquest of Bashan. And it says, it was in Carmel where Elijah brought the fire from heaven which consumed the sacrifice upon the altar after which he slowed the prophets of Baal. Now, it's easy to understand that the man by was commanded by God to feed God's people in Carmel, in Bashan, and in Gilead cannot be found in Carmel, Bashan, and Gilead. Or in other words, grammatically, the divine command. For example, there is a divine command saying, feed my people. So, let us distinctly separate the divine command given to that man to feed whom that he is to feed? God's people. Where we could find God's people? In Carmel, Bashan, and Gilead. It is grossly misinterpreted, brothers and sisters, that the one feeding is in Bashan, is in Carmel, and is in Gilead now. The one located in Carmel, in Bashan, and in Gilead are the people to be fed, given to such men to feed them. Meaning, there must be God's people in Carmel. There, ma be, there must be God's people in Bashan. There must be God's people in Gilead. And they must be fed. That is the statement, brothers and sisters. But it was grossly misinterpreted, teaching that God's headquarters must be in Bashan. God's headquarters must and also others say in Gilead. I would like to read to you this statement that here in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets 436. It says, But Moses was calm and firm. The Lord had said concerning the king of Bashan. Who is the king of Bashan? He is not God's people. King represents leader. Patriarchs and Prophets 436. But Moses was calm and firm. The Lord had said, Concerning the king of Bashan, fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his and his land into thy hand, and thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Sehon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at his bond. And then in the other paragraph it says, In the conquest of Gilead and Bashan, if the one residing in Gilead, if the one residing in Bashan are God's people. Why is it that they need to conquer them? But in our study, it's is, easy is to understand. There must be God's people in Bashan. There must be God's people in Gilead. But there is no such example that you could show that God commanded His people to establish headquarters in Bashan or in Gilead. I would like to read to you 2SR 200, uh, 255. It says, as there is no type for that which is false, to SR 255. And this is the only positive truth that, according to the shepherd's word, positive proofs and clear explanation of divine providences. To SR 255. As there is no type for that which is false, teachers of juries without a typical representation for their claims, of so-called Bible truths, and those who believe in them are as bl the blind leading the blind. The types are worked out to expose the error and reveal the truth. The honest ones will shun the devil by embracing the facts and by walking in the light. If you are honest, you will, sh you will shun the devil by embracing the facts that any movement without typical representation cannot be of God. Brothers and sisters, now, I would like to ask a simple question. Can you cite any example in the Old Testament that God commanded His people to establish headquarters in Bashan? Is there any citation in the Bible as an example, as the type? If there is no type, that is a false movement. According to that reading in 2SR 255, and the types are worked out to expose the error. 
and reveal the truth. But those who accepted such doctrines without typical representation, they are blind people lead by blind leaders. That is not my words. That is the words of the shepherd's rod. 2SR 255. And the only example that we could give is that, brothers and sisters, that when God's people is about to enter to the promised land, one of the victorious conquests is the conquest of Bashan and Gilead, according to Patriarchs and Prophets 436. That is very plain, brothers and sisters. Now, if you will read Micah chapter 7, it is divided into three divisions of time. And the verses that always quoted by our brethren, more particularly to Bayesian advocators, verse 14 and 15, that is the last and the third period in Micah chapter 7. And they cannot explain what is the first period, what is the second period. Thus, verse 14 and 15 commence in 1961. So where is the first period and the second period? I would like to read 1 TG, page 13. 1 TG number 28, page 13. This afternoon, we are to study the seventh chapter of Micah. This chapter brings to our attention three divisions of time. How many divisions of time? Three. In which three different conditions obtain on the earth? There are three different conditions obtained on the earth. The first condition is recorded in the first four verses. So Micah 7, 1, 2, 3, 4. That is the first division of time. The second in verse 5 to 14. You see the second division of time is verse 5 to verse 14. And the third in verse 15 down to the end of the chapter. So verse 15, brothers and sisters, down to the last verse is the third division of time. So we need to establish the three divisions of time in consecutive order. Verse 15 itself, brothers and sisters, Micah 7 verse 15, the commencement of the third division, it says, According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, which I will show unto him marvelous things. So these verses, verse 14 and 15, brothers and sisters, must be fulfilled at the time when God's people is leaving Egypt. Now, I would like to read 2SR 275. Beat what it says. 2SR 275. But the perfect fulfillment of the prophetic period of Abraham in its antitype is yet in the future going out of Egypt. And what is the specific place? By which ancient Israel abandoned Egypt. Goshen? What is Goshen? United States of America. Now let us read 1SR page 76. The land of Goshen stands as a symbol of the United States of America in which the church came into existence. If you will say United States of America, that is the 50 states of the United States of America. Therefore, the entire United States of America is called antitypical Goshen. So this is America. So this is called antitypical Goshen. And Micah 7 verse 14 and 15, brothers and sisters, must be fulfilled at the time when God's people go out of Egypt. Then, by prophetic events, we can rest assured that that statement, brothers and sisters, saying, Bashan, Gilead, I would like, Carmel, Bashan, Gilead, the fulfillment must be at the time when God's people go out of Egypt, which is Goshen, which represented by United States of America. So let us distinctly separate Micah 7, 14 and 15 and Nahum chapter 1, verse 4. So figuratively, the conquest of Bashan, the conquest of Bashan, the victories at Carmel, the victories at Gilead, figuratively pointing to the time when God's people in those places will be awakened with such absolute fact that there is no more water. There is no more water in Assyria. All the sea dried. All the rivers dried. 
And it was enumerated by the shepherds one by one. In track 1445, the ship could no longer be able to travel. Why? Because there is no more water. How could a ship or a boat travel without water? Meaning, unmovable. And languished, meaning about to die. All the living things cannot survive without water. Whether human being, animals, or plants. So the illustration is perfect. And according to 1SR 123, water represent new truth, the spirit of life, present truth, indicating there was no more present truth in the United States of America. The only they have are the books. The same with the Jewish people. The only they have are the books of the Bible. But they did not understand what is written in the Bible. They crucified the Messiah. So that is the only thing. All the books originated from ancient Israel, the Bible, the ancient vineyard, typifying the modern vineyard. All the books of the spirit prophecy originated in the United States of America, but the understanding was not given unto them. And the mere fact that they were in total ignorance concerning the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary, nobody discussed it, is the strongest proof that they were destitute of the dues of heaven. No more present truth. So, brothers and sisters, we will continue uh, this subject and I do fully believe that the first, the first verse in Micah 7 verse 1 is an indication of the prophecy that the righteous, the people of God, will be awakened. That there is no more. It says, verse 1, Who is me? For I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits. And that is pointing Jeremiah 8.20. The harvest is past and the summer is ended and we are not saved. As the grape gleanings of the vintage, there is no cluster to it. My soul desired the first ripe fruit. The good man is perished out of the earth and there is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. Brothers and sisters, whether you like it or not, that is the reality. The earth mentioned here is the symbolical earth. The good man mentioned here is inspired, inspired human being. All of them were already lying unconscious in their graves. The last inspired servant of God in the United States of America is Betty Hoffman. And there was no more prophecy ever recorded in the Bible and in the writings of Sister White and Betty Hoffman that God would raise up a divinely inspired servant in the United States of America after Betty Hoffman died. We will prove to you on our next episode. Thank you very much for listening and viewing this program. May the good Lord bless you and have a beautiful, wonderful evening.